This is going to be a video about how to present the gospel to a lost person, as well as some tips for witnessing or soul winning. If you're not 100% sure that you're going to heaven, please go to my channel first and take a look at the video, Are You 100% Sure You Are Going to Heaven? So part of my testimony is that I grew up in a Christian home, in church every time the doors were open, and I got saved while I was young. But I didn't know how to present the gospel to a friend or to a stranger until I was around 21 years old. I'm sure there are many people that similarly would say, I know I'm saved, but I have no idea how to tell someone else how to get saved. So first off, what is the gospel? The gospel is not that Jesus came to show us how to live. You cannot preach the gospel to somebody if you don't know what the gospel is. The gospel is found in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, which says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. The gospel is that Jesus Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, and that he rose again from the dead. The application of the gospel that saves a person is Romans 10, 9, and 13, which says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And verse 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So salvation is whenever you believe from the heart the gospel that Jesus died for our sins, was buried and rose again, and then you ask God to save you. You have to remember when you are witnessing, what is your focus? What is your route of attack? If your tactic is to get into deep, apologetic conversations with people and convince them to be a Christian that way, then you might win a few debates, but you will not win very many souls to Jesus Christ. The Lord did not equip us with a bunch of theology textbooks or creation science materials. The Lord primarily equipped us with the Word of God, and that should be your focus. This is very important. Do you think you're going to win people to Jesus Christ by using great arguments and having an answer to every objection? Good luck, but that's not what the Lord called me to do. He called me to preach the gospel. And he's called you to preach the gospel if you're a Christian. I'm not saying that apologetic arguments will never be useful, but that should never be the focus. If you're saved, your focus should be to preach the gospel. What's going to cut deep right to a man's heart? Your cleverly formulated words might get a few people thinking, but the word of God cuts through all that and goes straight to the heart. Now we are limited to persuasion. The Apostle Paul said, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. You can't physically force someone to get saved, although certain denominations in Christendom have disagreed with that through the centuries. So using wisdom, using clever persuasion is perfectly fine. But the core of everything you say should be the Word of God. Center every topic you talk about with somebody around a Bible verse or two. Hebrews 4, 12-13 says, 
For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. If you have the perfect word of God in English, the King James Bible, you've got the sharpest weapon a man could ask for. Now I'm from East Texas. I know some men who are absolutely crazy about keeping a sharp edge on a knife. If you hand them a dull knife, they'll never let you live it down. But the Bible in your hands, you don't have to keep an edge on that thing. It never goes dull. Ephesians 6, 10 through 20 is a great passage, and it lays out our armor as Christians called to be soldiers. The only weapon we are given is found in verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Do you know your Bible like you should? In the military, soldiers are required to strip their weapons down and put them back together blindfolded. You ought to get to know your weapon. So your tactic when you are out witnessing should be to slip in every relevant Bible verse you can. Obviously, you don't want to just rattle off verse after verse without explaining it. But as the Lord leads, slip in as much scripture into the conversation as you can. Let God do the talking through his word. It's okay to get sidetracked a little bit with theological questions that don't relate to the gospel. For example, sometimes people will get hung up on some certain question that they have for you. You just have to let the Lord lead you in those situations. Sometimes you should just say, look, that's a great question. I don't know the answer right now, but let me, let me get back to the subject at hand, the more important thing about how to get to heaven. And then we can answer your question later. Other times, the Spirit may lead you to very quickly answer that question and reel it back into the gospel. But realize that the devil is going to do everything he can to derail the conversation. And the lost person is going to try to change the subject to escape conviction, if you let them. Constantly reel it back into the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for your sins. Now, how to present the gospel. You could go to the video I mentioned before, Are You 100% Sure You're Going to Heaven? And you can memorize everything I say and use that. But I don't want y'all to be clones of me or some other man, and neither does the Lord. I'll tell you how I got started witnessing. My church goes out knocking on doors every Saturday, telling people the gospel. The first time I went with my pastor, he had me do the talking after he did the first few doors. I was stumbling and fumbling over my words, and I sounded dumb. But that's okay, because the person wasn't interested anyways. <laughs> I did that a couple more times and went home with the determination to practice so I didn't fall flat on my face next time. I took our church track that we were passing out, and I read each of the verses in there and explained it out loud while I was sitting on the couch. I did that a couple times until I had some idea of what I would say next time. It still took a lot of in-person practice to get better, but the Lord used that willingness to humble myself and practice explaining the gospel to nobody, or I guess to my dog sitting in the living room. I want you to get a piece of paper and write down these references and a short sentence about what to focus on when you explain those verses. Then pause the video, or after this video, get a second piece of paper and write out each of the verses. Practice explaining them. If you need some ideas for what to say, watch that video I mentioned, Are You 100% Sure You're Going to Heaven? 
and you can stick to my explanations for a little while and eventually come up with your own explanations, your own illustrations, your own stories to add in as you learn. All right, so here's the verses. 1 John 5.13 You can know you're going to heaven when you die. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. You cannot be saved by doing good works or being a good person. Romans 3, 23. Everyone has sinned against a holy God, including you. Romans 6, 23. Sin makes us worthy of death. And a side point I like to add in is Revelation 21, 8, that this death includes the second death, which is the lake of fire, and that all liars deserve to go there, which includes everybody. Everybody's told a lie before. Romans 6.23, going back to that one, God provided the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. 1 Peter 3.18, Jesus died to pay for your sins, and he was resurrected from the dead. That verse is very important. It's the gospel. Romans 10, 9, and 13. You have to believe that Jesus died for your sins and was raised from the dead and simply ask God by faith to save you through Jesus Christ. Believe in your heart and confess with your mouth or call upon the name of the Lord. Practice these verses. Memorize these verses. Real quick, before I get into the explanations I use for those verses, I want to give y'all some recommended gear for soul winning. As mentioned before, Ephesians 6 talks about the armor of God for the Christian. Verse 15 says, And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Shod, that's like putting on a shoe. So your army boots are the preparation of the gospel of peace. That's what you're here for, to prepare you to go to battle. You won't get very far without any shoes. One way to prepare is to get and use gospel tracks. If you're out in public, let's say you're walking down the sidewalk. And you see a guy standing alone, not doing anything. You walk up and immediately say, Hey, could I ask you a spiritual question? That's certainly a good way to open a conversation, and I definitely do that sometimes. But a much smoother transition to talking would be to walk up, hand him a tract, and say, Could I give you a little gospel tract, something about Jesus? And if he takes it, then transition Could I ask you a spiritual question? And I'll explain what I mean more about that spiritual question here in just a second. I also recommend getting a New Testament Bible. The New Testament is a lot smaller than a full Bible, and the most direct verses about salvation are in the New Testament anyways. In the video description, I've got a link to Church Bible Publishers. That's the New Testament that I carry with me. It just barely fits in my back pocket of my jeans, so it works perfect for that. I've also got a friend I go witnessing with a lot that carries a New Testament that is a paperback, and it looks like your standard paperback book. I think that's great too. It would be really intimidating to some people if you pulled out your full-size, giant print, wide-margin Bible that weighs 15 pounds. So a New Testament is a great tool to have. And the link I've got there, it's 15 or 20 bucks. Okay, so how do you get the conversation started? As I said, I think gospel tracks are great tools to use. You knock on somebody's door or you walk up to a stranger and say, Hey, I'm passing out some information about the gospel. Could I give you one of these? And the transition question that I always use because it works is... Could I ask you a spiritual question? If they say no, they probably weren't going to listen to you regardless of what you said. The question I then ask is, 
Are you 100% sure that you would go to heaven if you died today? If they say yes, ask them how they know. If they say, because I got saved when I was 10 years old, or because I put my faith in Jesus Christ, then it sounds like they're saved. Praise the Lord. If they say they know because they are a pretty good person, they're trusting in their works. They probably are not saved or they're confused about salvation. Clarify that and ask them, do you think a person is saved by faith and good works or by faith alone in Jesus Christ? If they give the wrong answer, take them straight to Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9. If they say, no, I'm not 100% sure that I'm going to heaven when I die, then you should say with compassion, well, the Bible says it's possible to know for sure that you're going to heaven. May I show you what the Word of God says? Then read them 1 John 5.13 and emphasize that ye may know that ye have eternal life. How could I know I have eternal life if it was up to me to earn it or to keep it? How do I know I won't commit a bunch of sins in the future and die without repenting? What if I creep into a drug addiction and die of an overdose? I don't know what the future holds, but I certainly know that I'm not perfect. So how could you know that you have eternal life like the Bible says? Well, the Bible says it's a lot easier than what you do that gets you to heaven. The Bible actually says it's a lot easier, a lot simpler. Ask the person, would you like to hear about how it's easier? I like to ask questions like that at the end of all my main points, to give them a way out of the conversation if they're not really into it. Would you like to hear more? I don't want to waste 20 minutes talking if the person is not really listening. And most people are too polite to tell you they aren't interested after you've started. So give them a way out of the conversation if they're not serious. Sometimes you'll get someone who says they don't believe there is a heaven and a hell. You'll get this response from atheists, agnostics, new agers, etc. To this I say... Okay, well, could I just give you a real quick summary of what I believe the Bible teaches? Because it's much different from what most religions and even many churches teach. And my real quick summary is this. The Bible says that we are all sinners and that every single person deserves hell for our sins. The Bible actually says that good works cannot save us Because God requires perfection to enter heaven, but none of us can reach perfection. That's why we need a Savior, and Jesus Christ came to die to pay for our sins, and He rose again from the dead. By simply putting our faith in Him and not in our good works, we can be saved from hell. And at this point, I'll ask the atheist, Would you like to hear more? If they say no, say, okay, well, thank you for your time. Have a good day. Now, after you read somebody 1 John 5, 13, next you want to take them to Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, and emphasize where it says, not of works. Whether you're talking to an atheist, Hindu, Muslim, Catholic, or Jew, if they are still listening... I want to move along quickly to get them over to Ephesians 2 and read it to them while I've got their attention, because it truly is what sets biblical Christianity apart from man's religion. If we're not saved by works, then how are we saved? Break the verses down, for by grace are ye saved. Grace is something you're given that you don't deserve. By faith. Faith is the only part we have in being saved. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. 
This gift of salvation is not of ourselves. We can't earn it, and we don't have to work to keep it. It's a gift. A gift has to be free and with no strings attached. If I gave you a birthday present and said you have to mow my grass to keep it, that's not really a gift. If I said, okay, you don't have to work for it, but here's a list of rules, and if you break one of my rules, I'm going to come take the gift back. That's not really a gift either. A gift has to be free, and a gift has to have no strings attached. God's gift is the same way. You can't earn it through good works, and you can't lose it through bad works. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Salvation is not a result of what we do, but rather it is faith in the finished work that Jesus Christ has already done. So if I hold out a gift to you, what do you have to do for it to be yours? Simply take it. But to take this gift, you have to understand a few things first. The first thing you must do is have the lost sinner realize that they are a lost sinner. You can't be saved until you realize you need a Savior. If the person refuses to acknowledge that they are a guilty sinner before God, they just ain't ready to get saved, plain and simple. Keep talking as long as they keep letting you give them Bible verses and then just move on. How do you convince someone that they are a sinner? With the Bible. Take them to Romans 3 and show them a few verses that pop out to you about how we're all sinners. I like to go with verse 10, verse 19, and verse 23. Once you get to verse 23, park there and expound on the Word of God. Use some illustrations or stories. Jesus taught the Word of God through parables and stories, something that relates to your common, everyday man or woman. Sometimes I'll use a courtroom analogy if they don't think their sins are that bad. If I walked out on the street here and shot somebody dead, and I got caught and was standing before the judge, and he asked me why he should let me go, what would I say? Oh, I'm a really good person other than that one mistake. It was only one person I killed, and that was a long time ago, Your Honor. I decided not to do that again, and I've been helping people ever since. What would that judge say? It doesn't matter all your good deeds. You're here because of your bad deed. You're here because of your murder. And if that judge let me go free, let's say he had mercy on me and he let me go free. Would he be a good judge? No, you're forgetting that the man I killed, maybe he had a wife and children to support who are now without a father and without an income. How would they feel if I walked free? Sometimes we get to thinking that our sin only affects us, but truly it affects everyone around us. And the Bible says that God is a righteous judge. He would not be righteous if he let sin go free for no reason. So here's another tactic that I recommend. Ask a lot of open-ended questions. This helps gauge where the person is spiritually. Don't just ask yes or no questions, but ask questions where they have to give more of an answer. Are they following what you're saying? If you're not sure, just ask them. Does this make sense to you? Open-ended questions also help the person get engaged. Most people's attention spans are used to 15-second blips of flashy video from social media. Don't just talk, 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 talk. Ask them if this makes sense. Ask them what they think about this. Listen and let them talk, and then give them the biblical perspective. For example... Do you think you're a guilty sinner? Oh, well, I'm sure you're not as bad as a murderer, too. 
But let me show you what the Bible says, that we're all actually guilty before God. Next, read the first few words of Romans 6.23. It says that we deserve death for our sins. I like to use the analogy, you've heard of minimum wage, right? Whenever you're working, you're earning a wage. And the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. Whenever you're sinning, you're earning death. Then I ask, have you heard of the second death? Well, the Bible says it's possible to die twice. Run them over to Revelation 21.8 and read the verse. After you read the verse, go back to the list of transgressors going to the lake of fire and pause. Say, I'm sure you aren't a murderer. You're probably not a sorcerer, right? But what's the last thing on this list? And all liars. How many murders does it take to make you a murderer? How many lies does it take to make you a liar? Just one. And the Bible says that all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. And if you're honest, we've all done much more than just tell one lie. We all deserve the lake of fire for our sins. Okay, so when you're walking someone through the gospel, everything up to this point can be very tense. Maybe you're at a stranger's doorstep showing them that they are sinners, that they deserve hell, that their good works can't save them. It can be very tense, but don't give up. Let the Holy Ghost do that work of convicting their conscience. And after this point, the tension starts to get a lot better. (laughs) Tell them, so I've told you so far, we're all sinners, we all deserve hell, and our good works amount to nothing before God. Being a good person cannot get us to heaven. Is that good news? No, of course not. Well, what I'm doing today is preaching the gospel, which means glad tidings or good news. So here's the good news. Go back to Romans 6.23 and read the rest of the verse. I like to say, thank God for this three-letter word, but. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We're all guilty before God, but God does not want us to go to hell. He knew we were helpless and could not save ourselves, so he made a way for us to go to heaven. And he could still be perfectly just letting us go there. Your tab was paid. All you have to do is accept the payment. Notice that this verse talks about the gift of God again. Show them the scripture and ask and let them answer, What is the gift of God? It says right there, The gift of God is eternal life. How long is eternal? forever. If God gives you eternal life, you can never lose it. It can never be taken away. It's eternal. It would be temporary life if it did not last forever. But God promised eternal life. Titus 1-2 also says that God cannot lie. As mentioned, 1 Corinthians 15 through 4 is the gospel. But it is kind of wordy, so I like to take people to 1 Peter 3.18 for a quicker summary of the gospel. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins. He suffered one time on the cross. Emphasize that he suffered one time, because Catholicism teaches that Jesus suffers again and again at Mass every Sunday. Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. Jesus Christ was perfectly just before God. And again, reiterate that we were all guilty before God, the unjust, that he might bring us to God. Why did Jesus die on the cross? You see, God is holy, which means he is completely separate from sin. He cannot have anything to do with sin. 
So all our sin is in between us and God, separating us from Him. Jesus came and took that sin out of the way. He took that sin upon Himself on the cross, and His perfect blood paid for those sins. Being put to death in the flesh, but quickened, made alive or resurrected, by the Spirit. Tell them, that is the gospel. Jesus died for your sins, he was buried, and he rose again, showing he has power over death, hell, and sin. Ask them, so you're probably wondering now, how do I get saved? Well, Acts 16, 30 through 31 answers that very question. Then take them to Romans 10, 8 through 13. Or if you're pressed for time, just take them straight to Romans 10, 8 through 13. Say, in Acts 16, 30 through 31, a man asks the very straightforward question, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they answered and said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. You have to put all your trust in Jesus Christ, not in what you do. If I came to you and said, I know I'm going to heaven because I believe on Jesus Christ and go to church and I'm a good person, what am I really trusting to get me to heaven? I'm trusting myself, my good works. If I trust in myself, I'm putting my trust in a sinner. And if I put my trust in a sinner, I'm going to get what a sinner deserves, and that's hell. What I have to do instead is put my trust in someone who's perfect, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, quickly turn to Ephesians 2.8 and remind them that you said faith is the only part we have in being saved. Well, Romans 10.8 says that this is the word of faith which we preach. This is how we express our faith to God to be saved. Tell them to listen for two parts mentioned over and over again, the heart and the mouth. Then read all of Romans 10, 8 through 13. Or if you're pressed for time, just go straight to verse 19 and verse 13. I like to show them the Bible and say, verse 9 says that you must confess all your sins, right? No, it says you must confess the Lord Jesus, not all your sins. And I'll say, do you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins and rose from the dead? If they say yes, then tell them that all they must do to be saved is to confess the Lord Jesus. Or in other words, verse 13 says to call upon the name of the Lord. Simply ask God to save you through Jesus Christ by faith. Quick side note here. Some people are resistant around this point. They might say, well, I've already done that before. I've always believed in Jesus. Now, some people would quit right there. I've had some people give me that answer pretty often. And after questioning them a little bit, it's apparent that we're not talking about the same thing. For example, I've read to some people Romans 10, 9 and explained it to them. And then they say, oh yeah, I did that. There was this time that I was going through a really bad difficulty and I didn't think I was going to be able to make it financially. So I prayed and asked God to help me and he did. Uh, is that what Romans 10, 9 is talking about? So with some people, you have to clarify. Ask them to tell you about the moment that they got saved. If it's a very vague answer, warn them. Explain that all the people that Jesus healed, these were all examples of salvation, pictures of salvation. When Jesus healed the blind man, that was a picture of, of someone being born again, someone receiving sight for the first time. That blind man, 15 years later, 
he might not have an exact date in his mind, but he knows a specific moment when Jesus touched his eyes and he was healed. He would be able to say, I don't know exactly what happened, but all I know is I met Jesus Christ and I received my sight. And if you don't have that same moment where you got saved, then according to the Bible, you're not saved. So if they say that they are already saved, point out that they told you at first that they thought work saves you. Sometimes people will flip-flop towards the end. And at the beginning, that's why I like to ask the question, what do you think it takes to get to heaven, to pin down what they're trusting in at that moment? And I think that saved people can give the wrong answer, but as you show them the gospel, they, they realize that, hey, my wording was wrong. Or they might even realize that they were trusting in their good works, but that in the past, they did have this moment of salvation, and then they went astray trusting in their works. I think that's absolutely possible. That's what the whole book of Galatians is about, is Christians trusting in works after salvation. But what you definitely do not want to do is give somebody who's trusting in their works false assurance that they're going to heaven when according to the Bible they're not trusting in Jesus Christ. If they're still resistant and you have time, you can take them to the beginning of John chapter 3 and show them what Jesus said about being born again. Give your testimony. Say, now that I've explained what being saved, being born again means, have you been born again before? All right, so going back to Romans 10. Now you must ask for a decision. Ask them, do you believe the things I've told you today? Let's review. Do you believe that you are a sinner guilty before God? Do you believe that you cannot save yourself through good works? Do you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins? And do you believe that he rose from the dead? If you believe these things, what does the Bible say you must do to get saved? Simply believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Call out to the Lord. Ask God to save you through Jesus Christ. Ask them, would you be willing to do that today? Don't be afraid to press someone for a decision. You don't want to pressure them. But at the same time, you've been reeling in this fish, reeling in, reeling in. You're not just going to put your fishing pole down and walk away and expect the fish to jump into the boat. There's nothing wrong with asking someone to pray and ask God to save them right then and there. So ask them, would you be willing to do that today, to ask God to save you? If their answer is no, then ask if anything specific is holding them back. Do they not understand something you say, say, was I unclear in anything that I said? And explain to them, as soon as I walk away, you can go to your room, go to your car, go to the bathroom, somewhere private, and just bow your head and ask God to save your soul. Romans 10.13 does not say that you have to pray in front of me. It says you just have to call upon the name of the Lord. It has nothing to do with me. But if you're not sure what to say to God, I can help you. And even if they still don't want to pray in front of you, give them a little warning that, hey, you don't know when your last day is. None of us know that we're going to wake up tomorrow. None of us know that we're going to that we're going to be breathing the next hour. Nobody's guaranteed their next breath. Say, I would still like to tell you the sinner's prayer. And real quick side note, if you're not completely sure about the sinner's prayer, you find it iffy, I recommend listening to Brother Randy Gorski at AV King James Bible Baptist Church. You can find him on YouTube. He's got a video called The Sinner's Prayer where he goes through verse after verse after verse and it's an excellent, excellent study on the sinner's prayer, so check that out if you get a chance. Say, all you have to do is simply say those things you believed today, say it back to God. There aren't any magic words, but if you need help finding the words to say, here's what I tell people. 
Tell God, Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. I believe your word, that my good works cannot save me. I believe that Jesus Christ came and shed his blood and died to pay for my sins. I believe that he rose from the dead, and I ask you to save me through Jesus Christ and take me to heaven when I die. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now if the person gets saved, praise the Lord. Tell them that they are now a child of God. Tell them that you're a child of God too. So what does that make y'all? Brothers and sisters in Christ. And ask them, do you think the devil likes what happened today? No, of course not. Ask, do you think the devil would hate it or love it if you never started reading the Bible or praying or going to a good church? He wanted you to go to hell, but he failed. So now he wants to do everything he can to keep you from living for God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Tell them you're a little more mature as a Christian, whereas they're a newborn baby in Christ. You're there to help. Get them a King James Bible and tell them to write down today's date in that Bible so that they remember the exact day they got saved. Get them good resources to learn more. Show them good preaching on YouTube. Find them a good church that preaches the truth. I've actually witnessed to people online through video chat and seen them get saved. I always recommend them to check out kjvchurches.com to find a good church near them. So if you ever see somebody get saved out of town or anything like that, that's a great way to, to try to get them plugged into a church. I also like to tell people, hey, the perfect place to start reading in the Bible is the book of John. Then go over to Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Those are all real short books that are really helpful. I also like to show people 1 Peter 2, 2 through 3. God's word specifically for newborn babes in Christ. This is how you grow, desiring the word of God. It's also good to pray for them before you go, praising the Lord for their salvation and asking him to give them assurance of their salvation and protect them from the world, the flesh, and the devil. So I know that this has been a lot of information. But I promise you, it gets easier the more you practice, the more you witness. Stick to the basic six or so verses I told you to write down at first. Practice makes perfect. These verses aren't strict either. You don't have to do it my way. They're just a good starting place to figure out what works for you, what you're comfortable with. But don't be afraid to make mistakes. Pray and ask the Lord to strengthen you, to make you a better witness, a good and faithful ambassador of Jesus Christ. Ask the Lord for a burden for lost souls. There are souls out there every day dying and going to hell without Christ. There are souls out there who have never heard the gospel. And they might just be right down the road from you. Ask the Lord for a burden to move you to action. Read Ezekiel chapter 33 sometime and tell me if that doesn't give you a burden to move to action. To close this out, let me read Acts 20, 20 through 21. Paul said, And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, Come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. And I believe the Lord is coming back very soon. What a great testimony for the Lord to come back and you to be able to say, I was gone fishing. Lord, I was busy fishing. What better way to spend the rest of your time here than to go a-fishing? God bless you, and thank you for listening.